Hello, I'm Ros Atkins. Welcome to today's Outside Source. China is warning the UK over interference in Hong Kong and over reconsidering the Huawei, the Huawei role in UK telecoms. If you want to make China a hostile country, you have to bear the consequences. The Americas remain the coronavirus pandemic epicenter. We'll be live in Brazil to talk about that. And why does President Trump keep talking about postal voting? We'll look at why it's become a major political issue in the US. Well, welcome to the programme. We're going to start in Hong Kong. It's been a week since China imposed a controversial national security law. Today, we got to see full details of the powers that it gives Hong Kong's police. Here's NPR's Emily Fung reacting to this. In a week's time, Hong Kong has gone from this mainland-based reporter's dream to an operating environment designed to strike the fear of law into anyone who wants to talk mildly about dissent. Well, the authorities published details of these powers on Monday night. As you can see, there's a lot of it. Here are some of the main points we've picked out. Under what it calls urgent circumstances, police can search a place without a warrant. Police under people under investigation can be prevented from leaving Hong Kong. If police consider what they call a message on an electronic platform, it's likely to endanger national security. They can ask the platform to remove it and ban the user. They can also ask the service provider to provide identification rec records or decryption assistance. While well, WhatsApp, Facebook, Telegram and Twitter today have said they've paused the processing of government requests for user data in Hong Kong, Facebook has said... We have a global process for government requests and in reviewing each individual request, we consider Facebook's policies, local laws and international human rights standards. Also, schools have been ordered to remove any books that don't comply with this national security law. Well, here's our China correspondent Stephen McDonnell reacting to that. He says, as is plain for everyone to see, the line from Beijing and Carrie Lam's administration that Hong Kong's state security law would only impact a handful of violent extremists is on so many levels demonstrable nonsense. By all means, defend the law, but don't lie, he says. In Hong Kong, pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong made this plea today. With the risk of our personal safety, with the threat of life sentencing, we might be worried and also being targeted by Beijing. But we also encourage the, world, the global community to let our voice be heard in the world. Once we still have any possibility, we still hope to let the world to know that now is the time to stand with Hong Kong. And now is the time for Hong Kongers to keep our momentum. Well, we saw what happens when there's pushback from the international community today. Last week, the UK offered several million Hong Kongers a path to British citizenship in direct response to this new law. Today, the Chinese ambassador to Britain said this. The UK government keeps making irresponsible remarks on Hong Kong affairs through its so-called six-monthly report on Hong Kong, make unwarranted accusations against the national security law for Hong Kong SAR, and even talks about changing the arrangement for British national overseas passport holders in Hong Kong. These moves constitute a gross interference in China's internal affairs and openly trample on the basic norms governing international relations. And then we have this response from the UK's Foreign Secretary. The real issue here is one of trust and whether China can be trusted to live up to its international obligations and its international responsibilities. And that's a message that we're telegraphing along with many of our allies and indeed uh, many international partners around the world to, the, to Beijing, particularly in relation to what we've seen in Hong Kong. Well, this new law in Hong Kong isn't the only issue that may impact UK-China relations. The UK's decision to allow the Chinese telecoms firm Huawei to be involved in its 5G network is being reconsidered. Here's Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I'm very, very determined to get broadband into every part of this country, you know, reaching out through, across the whole of the UK, and we're convinced that we can do that. Uh, and I'm also determined that the UK should not be in any way vulnerable to a high-risk state vendors. So we'll have to think carefully about how we handle that. We'll have to come up with the right technological solutions, but also have to make sure that we continue to deliver the, the broadband that the UK needs. Well, here's the BBC's Helen Catt on the domestic political calculations for the Prime Minister. 
a lot of the conservative backbenchers, there's a fair number of those who are still quite unhappy at the involvement of Huawei uh, in, in the UK's 5G networks, in telecoms infrastructure. So much so that even with a majority of, of 80, there have been some nerves about whether or not uh, Downing Street can actually get this bill through. So what's changed, though, that as I said, that's been pretty consistent for several months. What's changed, though, is the US decision to impose sanctions on Huawei. And what that's done is to uh, affect how it's able to manufacture its, its chips, its processors. And uh, there are concerns that that may now be less safe and less secure. And that is the sort of report that we understand is, is sort of being considered by the government at the moment and, and which could signal this sort of shift and this change. Uh, but of course, this whole thing is, is bound up not only in those sort of international disputes between China and the US, it's sort of getting pulled into that, but there's and the, the political uh, pressure here in Westminster. But of course, the other thing to remember is, is that if uh, Huawei were to, to not be involved or have to have its kit taken out of some of the UK infrastructure, there could also be consequences on things like the delivery of the speed of delivery of, of broadband. And that was a key Conservative manifesto pledge was to uh, roll out full fibre broadband everywhere by uh, 2025. So there's quite a lot going on here. So there are those domestic considerations, but there's pressure to make an example too. Here's a former head of MI6 writing in the Financial Times, saying the UK should bar Huawei from its 5G network and... The West also needs to unite and stand firm against rising Chinese aggression. Well, here's our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, with more on the global diplomacy involved in this story. Well, there's been a considerable shift even since January when the British government uh, announced that it would let Huawei uh, take up around 35 percent of the 5G uh, network, the infrastructure for that network. Uh, clearly, there has been a rethink. Uh, there's been a report drawn up. Uh, in recent weeks. It's now been submitted to the government. Uh, that report, as it, we understand, says that because the United States has imposed sanctions on Huawei, it means that the, uh, the technical, the offer that's being made by Huawei to the British, uh, uh, to the British government is, is no longer as safe and secure as it might be because they're going to have to rely on other technology. Huawei is going to have to rely on other technology since it can't access uh, American microprocessors and software. And so that is causing uh, the British government, which has argued that security uh, of the network is absolutely paramount, that is clearly causing the government to rethink. Probably in the next week to three weeks, uh, we will find out what the outcome of that rethink is. Well, from UK-China relations to the coronavirus pandemic, and America remains the epicenter of it. It has close to three million confirmed cases and more than 52,000 new infections were reported just on Sunday. Florida is one of the biggest areas of concern. The infection rate there is escalating. Total infections are now past 200,000. 11,000 of them were reported on Sunday. And this was all happening across the July the 4th celebrations at the weekend. This beach in Miami, well, um, it would be, as you can see, usually be packed, but this year it was shut and a citywide curfew was in place. And this is why Florida is taking this so seriously. Here's another stark statistic. Its infections rose by 168% in June. Its daily infection rate is now above any recorded by a European country at the height of the pandemic here. So Florida is right in the middle of this. So is Texas. Cases there are now past 200,000 and more than 8,000 people were hospitalized just on Sunday. According to local media, hospitals may reach capacity within two weeks, and there's an ongoing political debate about whether the state needs a stay-at-home order. From Texas to Arizona, infections are rising rapidly there, close to 100,000 now. Gyms, bars and cinemas have all now been closed until the end of the month, and more than 5,000 people were admitted to hospital on Sunday. There are concerns, too, in Arizona that hospitals may reach their limits. Here's one emergency doctor. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, we're having whole families who end up in the hospital. We had one family with three members who were actually on ventilators in the ICU. And you see how it's devastating for the families, the community, and for those of us who are healthcare workers holding their hands in their, in their moments of need. It's, it's nothing short of devastating. It, it's challenging because our workspaces in the hospitals are totally full, our entire staff and it takes an entire staff of uh, our team, uh, respiratory therapists and nurses, and even down to our environmental services and admin support to really be able to take care of patients the way we, we typically can.
And we're just not able to, both because the degree of sickness that the patients have, how much time it takes um, for each patient donning and doffing over and over again, and our exhausted workforce. We've been on um, deployment, essentially, if you will, since March, and it's simply exhausting. People are ending up with, with acute stress. Let's turn to Latin America now. I'll have updates on Brazil and El Salvador in a moment. First to Bolivia, and compared to some of its neighbours, it had been faring well. Unfortunately, though, the numbers are now starting to move upwards. Infections have passed 38,000, and there have been over 1,300 deaths. Also, the health minister has tested positive. The mining minister and the minister of the presidency have too. These escalating numbers are a particular concern because Bolivia is one of the poorest countries in Latin America. Its health systems ill-equipped to cope with the pandemic. These are pictures uh, from the city of Cochabamba. It's been badly hit and, as you can see, crematoriums are overwhelmed. These are workers digging makeshift graves. And this footage, shocking footage, illustrates the pressure on Bolivia's resources. This coffin holds the body of a 62-year-old who died from COVID-19 and it was left on the street for hours because cemeteries had had to close their doors. Well, next we turn to El Salvador. The chief of the cabinet, Mario Duran, is on the left here. In the past 24 hours, he's tested positive for COVID-19. The Salvadorian government has imposed some of the toughest measures in Latin America. That's kept cases below 8,000. A further reopening of the economy has now been delayed by two weeks. As I'm sure you know, Brazil is the epicenter of the pandemic in Latin America. Cases have passed 1.6 million. There have been more than 64,000 deaths. And some experts believe Brazil's now on track to become the country with the highest death toll by late July. At the moment, that's America. This New York Times graphic shows that Sao Paulo is the worst affected state. It alone has more than 320,000 infections. But even as this crisis worsens, Sao Paulo is getting back to business in the past two hours. Hair salons, bars and restaurants have all reopened. Well, let's speak to Katie Watson, who's there. She's live with us on Outside Source. And um, Katie, help me understand the justification for this reopening. What's the case for doing this, given the case numbers? Well, simply that they think that they can cope. I mean, I mean, if you take take the example of Sao Paulo, it's one of the wealthiest states. It's the wealthiest state, sorry, in Brazil. Um, in term, they've looked at issues such as uh, occupation of intensive care beds. Uh, the death toll, and they've they've labelled every uh, the, the, across the state. They've labelled municipalities um, in a series of five phases. So if you hit a certain phase and you can reopen, if you if if the situation gets worse and they have to go back to closing. So here in Sao Paulo City, um, they have been able to reopen. In fact, I've just taken a walk around the block, and for the last three months, uh, you know, there've been restaurants and beauty salons absolutely closed. It's been dead. But um, you know, just walking around in a space of you know a couple of blocks, there are several restaurants all getting ready, um, reopening, and it feels much more alive. But of course, uh, many experts are saying this is coming at, at, at completely the wrong time. And those businesses which are opening, presumably they're having to follow a range of rules. Absolutely. So one I walked by, you could see there were yellow arrows that had been uh, painted on the floor to show which way you needed to walk to uh, to collect your food in a restaurant. I uh, saw so another uh, several restaurants with hand sanitizer um, waiting there. So people obviously have to use that when they come in the restaurants and distant and distance tables as well. So those are the the the, the, the measures that they're, they're putting in. Um, but of course, it, a few days ago, Rio reopened its bars and restaurants and there were uh, images and videos coming out showing people absolutely packed into these bars, not wearing masks, as is mandatory across much of Brazil. Mm. Um, so the, that's the concern that people are now you know, desperate to get back um, to some kind of normality, yet we're still very far from that sense of that, that normal you know, normality here in Brazil with the death toll still rising. OK, Katie. Thank you very much indeed. This is Katie in Sao Paulo. Now, in a few minutes on Outside Source, we're going to turn our attention to postal voting in the US. I'm going to look at why it's become such a controversial political issue. The British government has announced emergency funding for theatres, galleries and museums. Will Gompertz reports. Theatres, music venues, cinemas and museums across the country have been brought to their knees by the COVID-19 pandemic, with many saying they'll be bankrupt within weeks without emergency government support. That 
arrived today, with Oliver Dowden, the Culture Secretary, announcing a £1.57 billion rescue package for the culture and heritage sector. The announcement has been warmly welcomed by many arts leaders, who say they can now see a way for their organisations to survive, at least until the spring. Of the total amount, £270 million will be made available as loans, with the rest, the vast majority, coming in the form of grants. There are likely to be many winners, but the money has come too late for some venues, which have already been forced to close, while others only just clinging on to the hope of a post-pandemic return. We'll go I'm Ros Atkins with Outside Source. We're here in the BBC newsroom. Our lead story is that China's warning the UK over interference in Hong Kong and over fresh questions about Huawei's role in UK telecoms. Now, we're going to take a detailed look at why the seemingly dry issue of postal voting has become a major political issue in the US. The presidential election's in November, and COVID-19 means voting is going to take a lot longer at polling booths. So many states are looking to expand postal voting. I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. I think if you vote, you should go. Mail-in ballots are very dangerous. There's tremendous fraud involved and tremendous illegality. They want to send out thousands and thousands of ballots, and then they're going to send them back. Who knows who signed the ballot? Is anybody standing there acknowledging, oh, that was Mr. Smith? This will be, in my opinion, the most corrupt election in the history of our country. And we cannot let this happen. Now, of course, just because Donald Trump says something repeatedly doesn't make it true. There's no evidence of widespread fraud in postal voting. We'll have more detail on that in a moment. But first of all, let's look at some background on postal voting in America. Four years ago, about one quarter of the ballots were posted. And the rate varies state to state. In some, you have to go to a polling station unless you have a valid excuse. Being over 65 is considered one. Living away from home is two. Then around half the states allow registered voters to vote by post. And there are 11 states where you have to vote by post. And that number's actually doubled because of the pandemic. So postal voting is on the rise. We're expecting states to further ease restrictions on it as we head towards November. Now, like most things, the issue follows the political divide. In this case, Democrats are keen. Republicans definitely are not. And understanding the reasons why tells us plenty about this election. As we heard from the president, he thinks postal voting results in fraud. The Republican Party is pushing that message too, for example, with parodies in ads like this. Are you tired of driving all the way to a polling location to vote? Sick of always having to remember your ID to get a ballot? Worry no more, because the fix is in. Introducing Ballot Harvest. Get fresh ballots delivered right to your door. Make your voice heard as many times as you want. We've rigged up our system to churn out ballots for every living thing in the country. Millions a day. Now, people who study elections say it's simply not the case that fraud is common among postal voting. But there are individual stories. For example, New Jersey made its municipal elections in May postal only because of the pandemic. Since then, two Democratic councilmen have been charged with fraud for allegedly approaching voters and collecting their ballots. That's connected with the discovery of hundreds of ballots in one mailbox in the city of Patterson. Go further south, two years ago, a congressional election had to be rerun after the Republican campaign seemed to break the law. A campaign consultant is facing criminal charges relating to allegations that he hired people to collect postal ballots and fill them in. Well, Mark Harris was the Republican candidate in that case. He was in the lead by 900 votes, but the result was annulled. At the election board, looking into all of this, he said the result shouldn't stand. I believe a new election should be called. It's become clear to me that the public's confidence in the 9th District seat general election has been undermined to an extent that a new election is warranted. Well, here's more analysis on this issue from Lana Atkinson at the University of New Mexico. It's very hard to find fraud. I think there's very little fraud, but where we do find it, it is systematic and it's meant to, um, you know, overturn elections. What I'm most about concerned about in this election is the um, perception of fraud and how that might lead to feelings of uh, delegitimacy of people's votes or, uh, you know, a feeling that the election outcome itself 
is in jeopardy, that maybe it's not uh, honest. If people don't feel that the election is free and fair, then the, sort of the whole enterprise of democracy um, becomes a lot more difficult. Well, some of the things President Trump has been tweeting on this particular subject prompted Twitter to do something it hadn't done to him before. It fact-checked a tweet and put a warning sign next to it saying the claims were unsubstantiated. So if the president's claim about widespread fraud is false, why do we think he keeps making it? Well, this may help explain it. President Trump expanded, uh, explained to, on the issue of postal voting proposals that he thinks they'll help the Democrats. On Fox News in March, he said they had levels of voting that if you'd ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. And there's also this interview in which President Trump, speaking to Politico, says uh, mail-in voting could cost him re-election and that the biggest risk was losing the legal challenges his campaign has in various states to try and rein in postal voting. Now, to be clear, what the president's saying about increased turnout hurting Republicans is pretty much received wisdom in American politics. But the reality when it comes to postal voting may be a little more complicated. Here's Lorna Atkinson again. There's no evidence that we see that, you know, Utah, for example, and Arizona are states that are vote by mail states and they're Republican states. And then you have, you know, the coast, California, Oregon and Washington, which are blue states. And they're also uh, either vote by mail or high vote by mail states. And so we don't see that it, it, it per se helps one party or the other. Um, and so, you know, it, it helps whatever party is biggest in your state. But there is certainly concern among Republicans that in a close election, postal votes may tip the balance against them. Michael Mosbacher is on the Trump National Advisory Board. While there has not been uh, widespread fraud, it, it, you know, it's usually about 1%, uh, according to um, this institution technology study, for example, the part of the issue is, is that in a close election, such as in 2000, remember the Florida recount? When it's a close election and you have this potential for individuals to take advantage of the system, it can make a big difference. Now, Republicans have already tried to strike down postal voting in some states before the election. If things go against President Trump in November, then there's also the option of doing so after the vote if he chooses to pursue that route. Now, his critics allege that by casting doubt on the process now, the president may be laying the ground to challenge the result later in the courts. His challenger, Joe Biden, says, it's my greatest concern that this president is going to try and steal this election. President Trump, for his part, says if he loses, he'll leave office quietly. Some, though, are concerned he won't. Peter Nicholas is a reporter with The Atlantic. He asks here, would the president honor the peaceful transfer of power if it meant admitting failure? Washington Monthly magazine offers what it calls a step-by-step -step guide to what might happen if Donald Trump loses the election but refuses to concede. Plenty of people think this is putting it too strongly, though. What everyone can agree on is that the outcome should be peaceful. Bear in mind there were some ugly scenes back in 2016 with riots in Portland and Oregon and in other places after Hillary Clinton lost. This time around, there are worries again, this time about how some of President Trump's supporters might react. These are pictures of a heavily armed biker gang which, who have filmed patrolling a recent Trump rally in Tulsa. They call themselves the Cowboy Militia. They said they were there to protect free speech. But elsewhere in the country, other militia groups have threatened violence if... As they see it, President Trump is cheated out of office. I want to speak to Anthony Zerka to get some help on this issue. He's live with us from Washington. Um, Anthony, on the issue of postal votes, do Republicans not accept that the pandemic creates an environment in which it would be appropriate to do more of that kind of voting? Uh, yeah, I think that's the surprising thing here is that while there is some concern and there is some instances that you talk about uh, of some fraud, it's not widespread. And when you balance that uh, against the greater good uh, of allowing people to vote without putting their health at risk, uh, you would think that everyone would be in support of that. But no, Republicans do view this. Uh, as a threat. They've explicitly said that they think that it could assist Democrats and that the reason Democrats 
are pushing this is because they see political advantage of it. So like everything else in this country, it has been swept up into kind of this partisan divide with both sides digging in on what appears to be you know, a, a battle for advantage politically. And we've only a minute, Anthony, but in terms of what Donald Trump has said, he has been quite explicit that he plans to go if he loses, hasn't he? He, he has. Uh, and I know there was talk back in 2016 of Donald Trump not leaving office or not uh, accepting the results of the election if he were to lose to Hillary Clinton. So all those that talk is coming back up uh, again. But I think more likely all of this talk about possible voter fraud uh, is it setting the stage for him to find an excuse for stepping down. All right, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, always good to have Anthony on the programme. There's much more on postal voting, lots of other stories besides on the BBC News website. And I'll see you in a few minutes.